Drives the right side. This is... He just drills a three right in his mug. The Sports Hub Celtic Show. Locks it up for Porzingis. With Chris Casper and Jim Murray. Brought to you by Shaw's and Star Market, Bentley University, and Jack's Abbey on 98.5 The Sports Hub. Shot clock violation. That's going to give us our final margin, it would appear. A colossal beatdown. And tonight, the bench holds its ground, extends the lead. The clock hits triple zeros, and the Celtics make a statement. A 37-point lead at Washington Monday night, and that was nothing. On their way to a 51-point win here at the Garden to go to 4-0 for the first time in 14 years. The final score, Boston 155, Indiana 104. That was the last game for the Boston Celtics. A few days off before they get back in action tonight against the Brooklyn Nets. Welcome into the Sports Hub Celtics show. All Celtics in NBA for the next hour. With uh, Jim Murray, Chris Gasper, Brian Robb covering the Celtics for Mass Live. And you, if you want to join us at 617-779-0985. You heard Grandy on the call there. Sean Grandy here. He, along with Cedric Maxwell, with the call here on the Sports Hub. Uh, saying that was a statement uh, that was made by the Celtics. Uh, I mean... You know, if they blew out blue doors against Miami, the, you know, about a week ago on the Friday night, you know, that to me is a statement. The Pacers, uh, who were down Halliburton in that game, like, yeah, statements a bit much. I mean, they're killing these teams. Uh, here's they the thing: are crushing teams. They're absolutely killing these teams. They're, these games are over after three quarters. Jen. Thank you. I, I do think that's a statement. Three? I think one. Chris, they're so good this season. These last couple of games, they're so good this season. They're going to make these games against trash opponents somehow even more unwatchable than usual. I'm and Felger talked about the ratings. The ratings are as high as they've been. I just, to me, the NBA, when you get blowouts, like, I'm, like, half paying attention. Really? Like, yeah, these last couple oh, games, no. I'm like, what do you want me to do with I this? I love like, this. this is you great. do. This is, like, the original dream team where I wanted them to destroy teams so badly that the basketball was in, considered an object of shame in other countries. Okay. I love blowouts that just suck the soul out of a team. So this is great. I, I want these teams to basically, I want guys to be like, I want to retire. I feel so embarrassed. I don't even want to play anymore. So I love this stuff. Okay. Yeah. And it, look, I mean, the ratings prove it too. I mean, they're as high as they've been, uh, especially for these games that are on NBC Sports Boston. So I think that, you know, you're, you're not alone in this. Celtics fans are like, yeah, pour it on, pour it on. But this is, I think it's actually good to see. And I do think it's legit too. I don't think this is a fluke. Like, you know, they they remain healthy. This is, I think, the best roster in the league. Well, the best starting five in the league. Uh, the bench still has its issues, but it's, to me, if they're going to be this good, it really shouldn't matter. The bench shouldn't be that much of a a concern, I don't think. Not until the playoffs, you know, when it's a little different. You're playing series and you're playing, you know, better teams. And even then, probably not until the, excuse me, second round uh, of the playoffs. But what I like is that they're handling their business, you know, early on. And that's important for this team, given their lack of depth. Uh, so the ability to look at what happened the other night against the Pacers and you're looking out there in the fourth quarter and it's all of the guys who you would want to be out there so you can rest your starters in the fourth quarter. You know, fourth quarter guys who played Hauser, Peyton Pritchard, O'Shea Brissett, Svee McKay Luke, Lamar Stevens, Luke Cornett, Delano Banton. It's Jalen Brown, Tatum Porzingis, Holiday, Derek White, Horford didn't play a single second in the fourth quarter. And to get through 82 games with their roster as currently configured, and I think they'll add eventually, that they do need to take advantage of these games against overmatched teams and get guys off their feet. Remember last year when we were talking about, or at least I was talking about, Missoula leaving Tatum out there in these blowouts oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to try and get triple doubles or Pat is scoring and all that other stuff? It seems like Missoula's gotten the message, and it feels like he sent a message as well on Tuesday. My colleague Adam Himmelsbach wrote about this. He had a reserves only film session after the reserves did not perform that well against Washington with the big lead they were handed and they were much much better against Indiana in that fourth quarter shooting 63 percent from the field and outscoring the Pacers 46 to 33 so I like what I've seen so far I like the fact that they're taking care of business and getting guys off their feet because it's going to be a long ride and a long run to June yeah so again there's I have to like scrape to find something for me about these blowouts like okay what can I glean out of these last couple of games and so that's number one for me the minutes management because you saw that last year and it's like these games that are blowouts, like, why are these guys still in? <laughs> so that's been handled better. I like that. And I think, you know, if the, if you believe, and I, you know, I think most rational people believe this, like, that Porzingis, he's going to be the number two this year. Like, I don't, I, you don't want that. I think this still is Tatum Brown's team, and there was some 
especially with that opener against the Knicks. It's like, ooh, okay, like, let's see how this is going to work. And you had to figure there was going to be some, you know, some bumps in the road early in the season. But I think you've seen Brown establish himself again these last few games as, yes, this is, I'm, you know, the two or one and a half, however you want to refer to it as on this team. And he has been more of a scorer in these last couple of games too. And a little bit less with the touches. If you look at some of the numbers, he's averaging 51.3 per game, third in the team behind Tatum and, and uh, Derek White. Um, you know, he hasn't had to create as much, but he, I think he has established himself as the two in these last couple of games, which is, I think, necessary for this team to get where they need to go. Yeah, I have to say, like, I, I really disagreed with uh, my colleague, uh, Dan Shaughnessy, what he wrote in terms of, you know, people making excuses for Jalen Brown. I feel it's the opposite. He had one bad game, and it happened to be the season opener, and people were piling on, like, this contract is terrible. Tatum and Brown don't work together. They can't win. I mean, it was one bad game. It was the opener. He came back. Uh, against Miami and scored 12 in the fourth quarter in that game. And then he lit it up against the the Wizards. I think he had eight threes in that game and was pretty good against Indiana. I mean, he wasn't great, but they didn't need him to be great. So uh, I look at it at the opposite. I, I, I'm going to take the big picture on this one. I don't know. And this is, you know, this might be hyperbole. I, I, I confess this could be hyperbolic. But I don't know if there's ever been another all-NBA player who is – least uh, uh, appreciated and gets more sort of guff than Jalen Brown. Like, I don't know, Celtics fans to me traditionally made more excuses for like Marcus Smart than they make for Jalen Brown in the in years past or right now. So I really disagreed with that. So I'm agreeing with your point. I think he's reestablished himself as the two. I think it's going to be a night to night thing. There will be nights when Porzingis is the two, but I also think a lot of it was like an over a gross overreaction which seems to happen with Jalen Brown when he doesn't have a good game. He was one game. It was the first game of the year, and people lost their minds. But overall, this isn't – do you think that this isn't a fluke? Like, this is what they can be if they play yes. to their ceiling. I mean, because it looks effortless thus far. It looks like they're having fun, which I think is important for, you know, players in the NBA. The defense, I think, has been top-notch as well. Like, even just exa- – for example, like, Porzingis wasn't featured offensively all that much in this game against the Pacers the other night, but still, on the defensive end, I thought he had a good night. Yeah, the one thing I would say, though, is that um, remember now, they got off to a lightning start last year. It was 21-5. and five. Mm-hmm. They had a different level of focus. They were telling us that after losing the finals. And then they kind of sagged, and they never really got that full focus back for the rest of the year, and they ended up with 57 wins, which is great. But, I mean, that should have easily been a 60-win team. So I don't want to overreact to to this start. Like, they're saying all the right things. They're doing all the right things. I hope it's different because Smart's not here. Not that he was entirely to blame for them losing focus. That's not what I'm saying. But just that that, that mix overall, uh, right? There was just something off where they couldn't sustain that level of focus. I'm hoping that this time it's more sustainable than it was before. You know, because, again, 21-5 and gangbusters last year. That start, playing every game like it was a replay of Game 6 of the NBA Finals against the Warriors – and then all of a sudden, they just reverted back to inflated accomplishment mode. All right, Brian Rob covering the Celtics for Mass Live. Our guy B Rob, is this all the any of this too good to be true? But or is this what what we're seeing is legit? They're a wagon. Yeah. This team, I mean, like, I'm sorry. Like you, you just look. I expected the the growth curve, if you will, to take a little bit longer than it did. And it looked ugly, like you guys talked about in those first couple of games here, but. The Wizards and the Pacers, you know, they're, they've won a couple games. So it's not like the dregs of the league. And to, to put those type of beatdowns on them and for the offense one through five to look that cohesive this early when they admit they have a lot of work to do, that that makes this team scary and makes and brought back memories of 07, 08 to me when that team just went out there and, you know, blue doors every night, it seemed like. Yeah, I'd overall rather this. Again, they should be cleaning up on these type of teams. I don't want to see them, you know, what did they have? Two losses to Orlando last year. There were games that stuck out like that one yeah. in Utah. Like, what are you doing? You know, uh, Mike says, uh, Felger says, like, you know, it's like they're playing with their food. You've seen none of that through these first four games. And that's good because they should. They should be absolutely dominating these teams. And they should win again tonight against the Brooklyn Nets. And then when we come back, you'll have to explain to me this game against the Nets. Is this part of the in season tournament? I don't know. What is this thing? So we'll touch on that along with your phone calls. Let us know how you're feeling about the Celtics right now. Blowing doors, 617-779-0985. Back with your calls next. Stay tuned for more of the Sports Hub Celtics show. You're listening to the 98.5 The Sports Hub Celtics show. All right, welcome back. 
Sports of Celtics show. Jim Murray, Chris Gasper, the Rob from Mass Live covering the Celtics. You at 617-779-0985. Undefeated Celtics on the road against uh, the Brooklyn Nets tonight. You'll have to catch that over on Rock 92.9, our sister station, because uh, the Bruins are on as well. And uh, they defer to uh, here on the Sports Hub when there's a bit of a conflict. So, uh, it's uh, Celtics looking to go 5-0 and against the Nets. Now, if they win tonight... What's is this a tournament game? The NBA in season tournament tipped off last night. If you tune into any of these games, you're like, "Wow, what's different here? Oh, these floors that are singeing my eyes. <laughs> what's it? What's it mean? I don't know. What? What's it matter? I don't know. Do you think the players know? Certainly not. Is this an in season tournament game tonight, B Rob? What? The, can you explain to me in one sentence what the hell this thing is and how it works? Because I've read how it works, and it like the words just clang off my rock head. Uh, I don't get it. Why are they doing this? Why are they doing this now? If you want to do something like this, shouldn't you do it like, I don't know, when there's like a lull in the NFL season, maybe like the week before the Super Bowl? Uh, before the Super Bowl? This just makes zero sense to me. So is this actually an in-season tournament game tonight? We're going to get a different floor in Brooklyn? No. Oh. So, all, so why? It's, like, a regular, <laughs> it's a regular game. Yeah, their, their right. first in-season, uh, uh, in-season tournament game for the Celtics is uh, – is, is, uh, Friday eleven ten. Yes. Right? And it's actually here against the Nets. Yes, so that's when you'll see the crazy green court. So here's the thing, Jim. They're gonna have all the in season tournament games for next month. They're all gonna be on Tuesday nights or Friday nights. Uh-huh. Those are tournament nights. Okay. Crazy court nights. Um <laughs> and so that's gonna happen. They're gonna have pool play. They're gonna each play four games against these other teams on these nights, and then they'll get to the knockout stage of the tournament, which eventually ends up with a final in Vegas in the first week of December. So that this is all a big money grab. They're, they have these crazy courts, so people will talk about it and get mad about it. I guess that's working to some degree here, but I'll see what happens. I mean, it's funny. Bones Highland, if you guys heard this the other night, Bones Highland, a Clippers guard, was asked oh, it was about the tournament. He's like, yeah, I have no idea what's going on. So it's pretty much <laughs> echoing exactly what you're saying here, Jim. Yeah, I mean, you look at the floor last night, the Bulls floor, which is like bright red. It looks like lava. Which at least maybe that would be interesting, like parts of the floor are lava, or like maybe you fall <laughs> through it, like trapdoor style, like Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> yeah, I, I just so it's not a tournament game tonight. No, so it's just a regular game. Yes. Okay, but had you won last night with those first round of tournament games, that still counts for the regular season record as well. Yes, <laughs> it all counts both <laughs> so both ways. I just I don't I don't get it. I think this is such a stupid idea. I I really do. And this is coming from you, who loves like these in season tournaments in international yeah, soccer, because right? They don't, like, because here's the thing: the NBA already has a tournament. It's called the playoffs. Right. That's the tournament, and that's the difference between you know. I know Adam Silver is a big admirer, as am I, of European soccer and what they do over there. And they have these in season tournaments, but one of the reasons they do that is it's another chance for a team to declare success or win a trophy because only one team at the end, the team that is the regular season champion, you know, gets a trophy. There's no playoffs. So it's to me, this is like redundant. In other words, you already have a tournament. It's the playoffs, which they don't have over in Europe for these leagues. So why do we need an in season tournament that has no meaning? I, I agree with some of the players. Like I said this for a while and Tyrese Halliburton said it the other day, at least give it some import. Say like, if you win this tournament, you get a top six playoff spot. So you're guaranteed to be in the playoffs and you yes. don't have to play in the play in or at least, or you could say you're guaranteed to at least host a, a play in game, right? You're, you're going to be no lower than the seventh seed. If you feel like giving them a top six is too much, but at least give it some import. But right now it has, there's no import to this. There's no reason for this. It, it just, it's a real, it's a force. It's a real force. It, this is like for the fans out there that get mad at, you know, like Jalen Brown, this is like Jalen Brown dribbling left, trying to go through three guys to get to the rim by Adam silver. He just loves soccer and he really just wants an in season tournament so bad that they're just going to do it because he wants to do it. It's the NBA equivalent of, of fetch. It's not a thing. Like stop trying to make it happen. Like I remember when we read about this at the time, I'm like, and I came away from like, well, there's no real stakes. No. Like these guys just to go get to go to Vegas and like get some extra money and like do everyone in sight. Like what's this matter to me as the fan? Like I and ooh, look at the fancy floors. And they only play them on Tuesdays and Fridays. So now it's even extra confusing. So like again, I went into tonight saying like, ooh, what's the floor going to look like in Brooklyn? Yeah, it's, well, it's it's just the same cuz it's a regular game. It's a regular game. <laughs> it's this isn't a thing. Like I, I you don't get it cuz you don't understand it. it no, no, you don't like it because you don't understand it. Yeah, I definitely don't understand it, but I don't like it because it's just stupid. Like, certain things can just be stupid. 
this is stupid. I agree. I mean, look, I maybe would not. I don't like this idea, and I just told you why. However, however, if the winner of this got a guaranteed playoff spot or something That'd else. That'd be kind of fun. I would understand it more, and I would say, like, okay, even if I don't agree with this, I better follow this because and it would be interesting to see how a team reacted, like, after they got a guaranteed playoff spot, depending on how it's set up. Do you just want to say, okay, coast we're, the rest of the way, coast and- the rest of the way, or the you know, seating uh, normally matters in the NBA. Do you still play for the seating? But I, I think that would be kind of cool, but otherwise just being like, Hey, you win this like generically named NBA in season tournament championship trophy. Who cares? And I think the one to that point, Chris, like the one thing I think that could save this tournament, make it like add to the buzz. If you get the Cinderella story, Winning the tournament. Like, right. if you get a Pistons team yeah. or the Hornets. Okay. Orlando, and, something exactly, like that. Exactly. Something like that, you know, get some buzz. Oh, wow, they're going to go to the Vegas stuff. But still, like, even if they win it, it's like, great. They did that, and now they're going to tank the rest of the season now. But if they got, like you said, a playoff spot or a play-in position spot out of it, that could be really fun. So I think the league, they need to tweak this as it goes. But that's that's the – I think they're hoping for something like that to make it kind of closer to, like, the NCAA tournament on that front. But here's the thing I'll say on that, and that's a great point by you, B-Rob, but what if – it's so obvious that, you know, this team got through pool play or got to single elimination play and won because the other teams that are really good just don't care. Right. Yeah, they're right. like, they're yeah. like, oh, we're more focused on winning the real championship, the Larry O'Brien trophy. We don't really care about these games that much. And that doesn't mean that you're not, you're sitting guys. Cause I know the league will come down on them for sitting guys, but it's like, we don't care. Like we're not playing super hard. It's a, to us, it's just a random Friday night to the magic. This might be the only championship they have a chance to win all year. So I think that makes the NBA look even worse. If it looks like a Cinderella team is winning. Cause the other teams that are really good, aren't really trying that hard. You know, not for nothing too. It's a pricey endeavor to go to any professional sporting event, but say, you know, you're a dad, you want to show your 10, 12 year old kid. Who's like obsessed with Tatum or Brown, take to their first Celtics game. Part of the experience of going to a Celtics game is to see the parquet the floor. Parte, it's, part yeah, of the, it's part of the aesthetic of going to a Celtics game. And you show up, and you don't really know this stupid tournament's going on. Going on, Kids pumped to see this first Celtics game. You go in there, and you're like, oh, what the hell is this? Like, this floor's stupid. Oh, well, it's part of the tournament. Dad, what do they win? I don't know. <laughs> hey, what about the parquet floor you told me about? Yeah, I don't know. Hey, why are they doing this? I don't know. It's, a, it's one big cash grab. For what it's worth, I heard the Celtics were against this floor idea initially. Oh, good. Like the, oh, league, good. the league forced all 30 teams Ugh. to do this, but they originally were like, yeah, we're not. We we don't want to go away from the parquet here, but so, it's, but the league uh, you know, superseded it, obviously. I, never, I, I was always say this. I never want to see anybody get hurt, but if, 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 <laughs> well, if there, one of these goofy floors. If like, there were some injury that took place on these goofy floors just to serve the NBA right and just to eliminate them, you know, it, maybe it wouldn't be – there would be, I would say, there'd be a silver lining to a horrible thing. All right, Tim and Nashua with a thought on this uh, in-season tournament. Go ahead, Tim. You're first up here on the Celtics show today. Hey, thanks for taking my call, fellas. First on the court, I was on the lead pass last night. Uh, I had the four boxes going. I thought I was watching, like, NBA 2K Twitch stream with these courts. Those are just, <laughs> those ain't it. Um, then, yeah, Gatsby, you kind of stole my thunder. Okay. Uh, I like the corollary between the, you know, soccer tournaments, but you're right, it doesn't make sense. Uh, given that there's a real tournament at the end of the season. And then just lastly, you know, for the Celtics, you know, this team looks like a wagon. They're awesome. I don't want them to peak in December. I don't know how to feel about this whole thing. I don't know. I'd just love to see them get through this tournament and, you know, on to bigger and better for the uh, playoffs. Thanks, fellas. I think that's a great point and a great call about peaking in December. Uh, B-Rob, I don't know how you feel about this, but I think you can make that argument about last year's team with the 21-5 and five start, that they that they peaked – too early and they did sort of peak in December and they, they lost their mojo and they never really quite got it back. Without a doubt. Like that was a situation where there was no growth in terms of how they're playing and, and the way they played. Like they just, they won games when they shot hop from three mm. and that was it. And then they never really adapted from that. And I think Joe Mazzula kind of stuck too close to that. And to his credit now, he's admitted that he's, they're trying different things there. And I think what we've seen in the first week here, guys, they've won, you know, they've been crushing it on the offensive boards they won the first two games when they shot worse than the Heat and the Knicks, so that's at least some progress on that front. Yeah, let me give you a couple stats here that show you that the Celtics have diversified their path to victory. One, uh, opponent field goal percentage. The Celtics are number one in the NBA right now. Can you believe it? They don't have Marcus Smart. The Wow, this is stunning. Yeah, they don't have Marcus <laughs> Smart. They don't have the, the DPOI. Yeah. But they are still number one in the NBA in opponent field goal percentage, 42.5. The more shocking stat to me 
They are number one in the NBA in rebounding, which I never would have thought. Wow. Yeah, they are number one in the league in rebounds per game, 52.3. That shows you how much Porzingis has, has changed it and also just maybe how differently they're playing. But no team pulls down more rebounds per game right now than your Boston Celtics. Well, a lot of that is Tatum, too. I feel like he's almost good for, like, 10 a game. Yeah, up. he's – I think you know, Jim, like, that is uh, – you know, he talked about wanting to be on, like, a defensive, you know, all-defensive team this year. That's the sneaky part of his game right now is, like, yep. he can grab 10 boards like it's nothing. And that's huge for a team like this that is playing when he's playing power forward in the starting lineup. Like, if he can do that and score 30 points a game, that's, you know, that's MVP-type stuff. couple open lines you want to join us. Talk C's in this goofy NBA in-season tournament that started last night. Could you feel the excitement? 617-779-0985. Your call's next. You're listening to the 98.5 The Sports Hub Celtics Show. Strong. This is the 98.5 The Sports Hub Celtics Show with Gasper and Murray on The Sports Hub. Sam Hauser in nine tries. 126 107. And there will be some issues discussed about the bench tonight after a truly dominant performance by the starters. Isla gets in the passing lane, picks off the lob attempt for Kula Bali. The clock will hit triple zeros, and that will do it. The Celtics' top six, considered by many the best in the NBA, and they showed out tonight, dominating the Wizards. And the bench hangs on. The final score, Boston 126, Washington 107. Randy and Max at the end of the uh, game against the Wizards on Monday, 126-107 was the final. You hear him talking about the bench there. Much will be discussed about the bench. I mean, if you want to, I mean, yeah, sure, but, uh, shoot, the Wizards had, what, 32 points to the Celtics 18 in that fourth quarter. Like, I, I'm just not going to read too much into that. I know, like, maybe they lack some size in terms of another big man and with depth, but... Like you mentioned, though, like that, they're top six. Like they're as good oh. as it gets in the league. Like I I'm not going to worry about the bench that much. I mean, I jokingly said to B Rob, who obviously covers the team full time for Mass Live, you know, read his stuff. It's great, especially that mailbag. I always learn a lot. But I jokingly said to him, I was like, "How's it? How's it going covering the Harlem Globetrotters?" I yeah. mean, it's like, <laughs> it, it, yeah, did right. they play the Wizards or the Washington Generals? Because that's what it, it looked like they were playing the Washington Generals. Uh, Dean and Shrewsbury, our guy Dean. You enjoying the blowouts right now, Dean? Do I want to what? Are you enjoying the blowouts right now on behalf of your Boston Celtics? Oh, I Celtics. am Dominance enjoying the Celtics. blowouts. But, but before I get to that, I just wanted to say, how could you guys forget Josh McDaniels and Tim Tebow's playoff win? That was a, a big one. Oh. Everybody thought Tebow was going to be the future. Yeah, right. No, but that... Josh was gone, though. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah they he, fired him. He was him. gone by 10. I mean, it was that season, but he he wasn't the coach. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. No, no, they, they fired him, and then the team, like, caught fire with Tebow. Uh, but, yeah, Josh was not the, the – was it Eric Studsville or somebody? Was no, it? wasn't it John Fox, I believe, at that was point? Fox was Fox still it? the coach? Either way. But go ahead, Dean, on the Celtics. Uh, yeah, I'm enjoying the blowouts, and I think they're going to continue. With the starting five, there's always a mismatch on the floor, and it's been so ridiculous that there's no way to double anyone. They had – Chris Sops for Zingas, I think it was against TJ McConnell in the post. And the double came from Tatum's side in the weak side corner. And Chris Stops just uh, kicked out to Tatum for a wide open corner three, which is on th- that would be unthinkable yes. last year. 80% of their three, around 80% of their threes have been uncontested. And they're second in the league in post-ups per game. So their offense is more diversified with Porzingis and and Tatum being two of the best uh, post-up players in the league. So I I really think and I hope they do that these blowouts continue. Um, It just shows the strength of the team. I'm not one of these guys like Maz who who thinks a team needs to be uh, contested. I think the more blowouts, the better show for the quality of the team. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they're going to like. I would rather see this than them struggle against suck teams. Like you I know, agree. you know the, the the nervous Nellies of the world be like, oh, they're going to pick up bad habits. They're going to think it comes too easy. No, I think at this point, 
especially for Tatum and Brown, you're like core guys on this team. They know what's at stake. You know, they have failed these last couple of seasons deep in the playoffs, in the finals a couple of years ago. Obviously. But I, I think you have to take into account, too, the teams they're blowing out. You know, obviously they're not. The Pacers didn't have Halliburton. So these aren't the best teams, but it's not like they haven't been tested. They were tested by the Knicks. I mean, they were down six with 313 to go. They won. They were tested by the Heat. So it's not all or nothing. In fact, I think it's the best case scenario against, and I know the Heat have not gotten off to a great start here, obviously, but against teams you think maybe can give them a little bit of a test, and certainly the Knicks gave them a test and a hard time last year. They've been able to come through in the clutch and deliver and play well in the fourth quarter, particularly defensively. Then against teams where you're like, this shouldn't be close in the fourth quarter, they're blowing them out. I mean, what more could you ask for at this point? Obviously, it's a very small sample size. I did want to just ask B-Rob, though. That, that is a good point by Dean. What have you seen, B-Rob, in terms of the offense being diversified now with Porzingis as a post-up option? Yeah, just he is, I think, opening up the floor more in a sense of being like, in the past, when they go, if you had defensive switching on the Celtics and be a little guy on Rob Williams down low, he, Rob Williams wouldn't push, punish him a lot of the time. He'd look to pass first. He wouldn't, you know, he'd get a lob here and there, but he he wouldn't get 20 points a game. Now, Porzingis, it's like, if you're going to put Kyle Kuzma or some other guy who's five inches shorter than him, like, Porzingis will eat that up and get 20 points before you blink. So that way now, it's making teams think more. I think Tam's also going into the post more and getting easier looks down there too. So he's not relying on the step backs as much. So when you factor it all together, when they run their offense, they're just getting easier looks, whatever part of the floor they're in. And that's helping lead to that diversified offense that Dean's talking about. Alejandro in Maine wants to talk about true holiday. Hey, Alejandro. Hey guys. Uh, just really quick. I saw a tweet yesterday, which I thought was really funny. It was Rob Williams and Marcus smart embracing before the game. And the person said, oh, my God, I miss them so much. And just in my opinion, like, I just love this new look team. Obviously, like, I'm going to wait to see what happens past December. Obviously, what Gasper's saying, we saw the hot start last year. We got to see what happens. But specifically for Drew Holiday, I really love just, like, that he's quiet. He comes in, does his job. He's just the guy in the locker room who's contributing a little bit every single night. He's not like smart who had a big voice who thought he was the third star. So I just really love, I think it's just eye opening to have a leader in the room who's pretty quiet, who does his job. And I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Also love that you guys touched upon the in season tournament. Cause those courts are absolutely hideous. Thanks guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Yeah. Great call from Alejandro. He, uh, there's a, I said this to Mike and Tony the other day. There's a, the, when I look at these blowouts, Chris, there's a seriousness to this team that, you know, it's only small sample size, four games, but I don't remember seeing that. Like, I think they all know that. But I also think Drew Holiday, given the fact he's won a ring, you know, veteran, I think he adds to that, like to this overall seriousness that you see with the Celtics so far. Yeah, it's interesting when I watch Drew Holiday play. I mean, again, he gives you a lot of thing that a lot of things that Smart did. He's a better offensive player. He has a championship ring. And as Alejandro said, he's not as big a personality. There's like a quiet dignity to Drew Holiday. You know, he's just professional. He just sort of goes about his his job, goes about his work, does what the team needs him to do, willing to accept his role. I feel like maybe the chemistry, on-court chemistry, because, you know, Smart and Tatum and Brown, those guys are close, and they're going to be close for the rest of their lives. You saw that, them all going to Smart's wedding. But I think maybe the on-court chemistry, the on-court fit is already better with Holiday than it was with Smart. And I also think that maybe not having Smart allows White to spread his wings a little bit and, I don't know, play in the fourth quarter. Justin and Peabody next year on the Sports Up Celtics show. Hey, Justin. Hey, uh, I just wanted to bring up uh, the in-game, uh, like in-season tournament. I feel like they need to just look at it as a normal season, just with normal games. But I also think it's a great uh, feature for them so they don't end up choking in the quest to get Banner 18. In terms of the Celtics now, we're not talking global in-season tournament. He's talking specifically about the Celtics. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I hear what he's saying. Yeah, you could approach it that way, yeah. but I just don't see them approaching it with those do-or-die circumstances or that do-or-die mentality. You absolutely could r- use it as a ramp-up if you wanted to, but I-, I don't see them actually doing that. And what's the benefit ultimately – of doing that, you know, if this, in other words, if the Celtics, if the Celtics win the in-season tournament, does do we feel like that makes them more likely to win the championship? 
No, because they're just means they're winning regular season games. They've been gussied up with a stupid court again. Why? Like I, and they got to go to Vegas. Yay! I mean, like, the Vegas part of it, B Rob, you probably know this better than than I do. First of all, there's the quarterfinals are on your floor, but it's single elimination, right? right correct. Yep. Yeah, and then basically it's only the NBA's version of the Final Four that's in Vegas. So that maybe you can make a case that if they make it, you know, if they win the single elimination games, that's a good ramp up for. The playoffs, especially for a team that lost a game seven last year at home, but it's all in December though, so it's like <laughs> it's such it's like it's gonna no one's gonna remember the in season tournament when the playoffs roll around. I feel like right, like, it's, it's not a thing. It's we're, we're, the, the NBA is so desperate to make this happen. Are you it's, saying are you saying that there are some red flags or yellow flags with the NBA's in season tournament? Is that sports? It, I know what a red flag is. What yeah. it, what what, what does today's youth mean by a yellow flag? Uh, caution, I, but I'm going to proceed anyway. Yeah, caution. It's like you might want to think about labeling it a red flag, but it's not there yet. Do you see any green flags, Jim, from the I don't. No, I don't see any of the positives okay. in this. Oh, no, in fact, I would call this whole thing mid. How about that? <laughs> uh, I right. would call it sus. Is that, you know, is that the worst of the things that, these, that the youth is saying today? I think sus is worse than mid. Yeah. Well, no cap. I, uh, I cannot stand the uh, the NBA in season tournament. So, and obviously, you guys have thoughts because you're all lined up on that. We'll take your calls on this in, uh, NBA in season tournament that started last night. That I don't think anyone, any rational person, knows how it uh, it works. Also, want to touch on uh, other couple of uh, things league wide. Like, uh, hey, guess who's now zero and six on the only winless team in the NBA? And I want to get Chris and B Rob's thoughts on Victor Wembayama, who looks like an absolute, you know, a studs stud. Uh, so we'll touch on that along with your phone calls next on the Sports Up Celtics Show. We'll have more of the Sports Hub Celtics show next. The Boston Celtics play here. Hit him for a 50 piece. This is the Sports Hub Celtics show on the Sports Hub. All right, before we get to... Uh calls because people have thoughts on this in-season tournament that started last night can you feel the excitement at all? Uh, i want to get uh, your guys thoughts on a couple of things league-wide uh first uh, should we uh, still fear the deer guys uh even though the uh, bucks won uh last night they're now three and two on the season but it's been a bumpy start for the whole dame Giannis thing who uh, the pick and roll is going to be lethal how is anyone going to stop that well uh they've run it uh reading here uh, from espn a grand total of five times over four games Sorry, five times, four games. And uh, over those uh, five possessions, they're averaging uh, one point per possession. Uh, one, one point per possession. So it, it's it's just it's been a mess. And it, you figure this is going to be some bumps in the road to start here, but it hasn't looked great. Uh, and there was a game against the Hawks where, uh, I think that was on Sunday, where Lillard had like eight turnovers, no points. Like it looked like a mess. So thoughts on the Bucks thus far? Not looking great. Uh, 28th in defense. Overall, we I think that everyone thought that would be the Achilles heel coming in. That's been coming to fruition. And I don't know, guys, like Lillard, for as good as he is, I mean, we'll, this will ultimately be judged in the playoffs, but he's getting up there in age, and we've seen point guards that don't necessarily age great when they get into their yeah. mid 30s there, and he might be that guy. Uh, and then there's Victor Winbayama, who has uh, looked, you know, uh, he's he's pay- the hype is paying off thus far, and uh, you know just how smooth he is. Uh, you know, the shot looks great. Uh, defensively, he's looked like an absolute stud. It's just he's been a human highlight reel thus far. I know you have some thoughts on him, Chris. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's been as advertised when you watch him play. It just the ability to do the things he can do at his size, and it's like who's going to really stop him in terms of you know uh, his shot making ability is good, but I think it will only get better. And it sort of reminds me in some ways a little bit of Dirk where it's like the guy's so big that you're at his mercy. He's going to get his shot. It's just a question of whether he makes it or not. Yeah, some of the the highlight package that I saw against uh, Phoenix is what stood out to me. You mentioned Dirk. So, like, he had this innate sense to know where, like, his teammates would be to set guys up. This hasn't been about him. It's like, yeah, he has the playmaking ability. Yes. But it also... Like, he's he looks just like a solid teammate and a great passer as well. He That's looks like true. the complete package. No, I would totally agree with that. And and just, again, that ability on both ends of the floor to move, to, to switch out on shorter guys and be able to stay in front of them. And then offensively, obviously, his ability to handle the ball and just the way he moves. That's yeah. I think LeBron had it right in calling him an alien. It's like, how is this guy able to do this? 
And then, uh, go ahead, B. Robbie. You know, the, the sense of urgency for teams to win now before this guy gets to his prime should should only go up now because based on what we've seen. That's a good point, too. Teams. I agree. And then there's only one team that has yet to uh, win a game uh, in the NBA. That is the Memphis Grizzlies, who lost last night to the Portland Trailblazers, 115-113. Oh, and then, I thought they were 0-6. Now they're 0-7. They're 0-7. Huh, who's on that team? Oh, that's right. Mr. Winning Plays, Marcus Smart. Your thoughts, Chris? <laughs> Just team you. He's played pretty well. I don't think it's his fault. I think, you know, Jaron Jackson is the guy that hasn't really uh, been consistent or gotten the job done for them. But we were sort of talking about this off the air. It is surprising when you look at that. They still have my guy Desmond Bain there, who I like a lot. Uh, but you're know, losing games. They've lost to D- Utah, New Orleans. You lose to a Portland team that didn't have Anthony Simons playing in the game. It's just really sort of weird to me in terms of what's going on there. You know, Smart didn't play well in the game last night. He was four of 12, but over, and he was a minus 19, but overall I think he's played pretty well for them, but they just, it seems like they just don't have any real chemistry and we'll see if they can make themselves relevant by the time John Morant comes back from, you know, his situation. Yeah, Matt, the go. rest of the, I mean the rest of the roster I feel like Jim has just overachieved around like in past years and now it's like oh it's all like like the West has gotten better and they have they brought in Marcus Smart and this is like kind of where they're left now. Yeah, I uh, I set a futures bet on uh, BetMGM for uh, sell because that's what I am. Uh, that's what that's what I want to endorse. BetMGM, download it. WBZ Mass is the promo code. Please uh, do that. Uh, I made a futures bet for Celtics Grizzlies finals. And uh, I cashed out of that after this week. I'm like, you know, no, this team's no good. I bought into too much hype about how deep they are. Celtics certainly good. They can yeah, get there. Should win it. Grizzlies, not so much. Uh, Matt Malden with thoughts on this in-season tournament. Hi, Matt. Hey, before uh, my in-season tournament comment, I just wanted to add, you were mentioning Drew Holiday a moment ago, and I just wanted to say Drew authentically in his, in his post-game interviews authentically sounds like how Kyrie Irving always tried so hard to artificially sound like in terms of maturity, basketball wisdom, and like Gasper said, quiet dignity. But on the in-season tournament, first of all, the floors look like air hockey tables. It's like watching the, the, uh, the basketball equivalent of foosball. Second, the NBA Cup feels sillier than the Mega Bowl from Semi Pro. <laughs> and finally, as stupid as we know, as stupid as we know this is, as stupid as the players know this is, it built into the future is a cringeworthy Hall of Fame post-game interview for this Vegas NBA Cup Finals where there's going to be the MVP of the game who says, yeah, it's an honor to be the first team. It's going to be this cringeworthy post-game interview, which might be amazing or might be horrible, but it's built into the future. Look forward to it. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I just hope the guys keep it real. Well, what's this mean to you? Uh, not much, really. <laughs> I mean, got to come to Vegas for a few days. Got some extra money. Cool, I guess. Nolan and Spencer, your thoughts on the tournament? Go ahead. Hey, so you were uh, talking about how Adam Silver is influenced by the the soccer uh, model. Um, And I think it's also kind of influenced the the NBA's de-emphasizing of physicality and defense. I think Joel Embiid had 11 games last year where he scored uh, 14 or more points from the line, including a 20-point game and two 19-point games. And I just think that the ticky-tack fouls and the lack of physicality sucks now. I can see that. I mean, they definitely have tried to open up the game. The pendulum tends to swing sort of back and forth, right? Because I thought Pat Riley almost killed basketball when he was the the coach of the Knicks. And then when he first went to the Heat in the 90s, I mean, that was unwatchable, to be honest. It was terrible. It was was more like basket brawl, just grabbing guys and all this other stuff. I I actually like it now. It's more free-flowing. It's open. But it is frustrating, though, and I thought it was frustrating at times during that playoff series last year with Philadelphia – just watching a guy constantly have a parade to the line on stuff that is, you know, kind of ticky tack. But I would also say, like, I, at this point, and this is the thing I never hear from Celtics fans, and maybe it's just because you're focused to train after all these years on the Celtics getting the short end of the stick. But you know who, to me, other than MB, gets more ticky tack free throws and more like, oh, he missed that shot, so we better send him to the line calls than anybody? Tatum. He gets a ton of those. Yeah. And he's, all, and he's looking for him, too. I mean, he puts, you know, he's Mr. Palms to the sky. So he's looking for him, too. So it can benefit you as well with your superstar. He gets a ton of those calls. Hadley in Exeter uh, with a Celtics thought. You're next here. Hey, Hadley. Hello. Hadley's gone. Uh, Jack in the car with a thought on the NBA tournament. Go ahead, Jack. 
Hey guys, just uh, when you were talking about the soccer analogy, uh, when they have these cups and these in-season tournaments in England and with the other places, you do get something like a playoff spot at the end of it. You get oftentimes qualification into one of the continental European tournaments at the end of the year. So I, I don't know what Silver's doing. I think that's an easy way to sort of bring some spice to the in-season tournament, and it would make sense given sort of what he's trying to emulate. Thanks. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, it would make sense to sort of, you know, change it up. And it just means something to it in Europe. Again, if you win the League Cup, like, that means something because that might be the only thing you win because only one team can actually walk away and, and say, okay, our season was an absolute success from the standpoint of not winning, the, you know, just winning the championship there. Teams can say, oh, you know, we were building, we made the playoffs. Now, obviously, you can qualify, as he sort of referenced, you know, for the Champions League. It's it's like top four finishers, like in the EPL and stuff like that. If you finish in the top four, and that's very important. But, again, any sort of tournament, any sort of competition has to have some stakes. And even overseas, I think you look at some of these things, and, they, you know, the FA Cup, for example, is very meaningful over in England. I would argue at this point in the EPL's evolution that the actual like league cup whatever that's called now caribou cup whatever they call it doesn't the really caribou cup. doesn't really mean that much you know anymore so if, the more of these competitions you tend to have the less meaningful they they end up ultimately being and i and i by the way i just want to appreciate our listeners for reminding me what the actual name of this thing is and how stupid it is i forgot that they had named this trophy the nba cup that is the <laughs> dumbest name the i've N- ever heard of we won the nba cup what's it mean to you not that much because you know, this is this is just a because it's me it is an old thing now like because you know what we used to call in-season tournaments most of my life games or series in baseball. In the years before the nerds created load management or openers in baseball, they were wins and losses, and they mattered to players, fans, when people wanted teams to win because losing sucked. Well, you know what I, I look forward to is, too, like the, what the caller referenced, the Hall of Fame thing, where it's like, yes, you know, a four-time NBA champion and three-time NBA cup winner. Like, that's just what we're going to get, like, at some of these inductions and, and what's going to be on guys' resumes and stuff. You know they're going to try and pump this up. Yeah. He, you know, he won three NBA cups. Yeah, it's the Millicans of the world. I blame for this. It's because the concept of winning and losing, it's been diminished. We just care about being competitive or, you know, well, he's trying to build towards the future. And as a result, you get the NBA creating this fake tournament no one understands or cares to care about. And and, and they're right. And as we're talking about nerds, let's touch on one. So, uh, Millican and nerds, his new guy, Heimblum 2.0. That's be uh, Craig Breslau. I know that uh, re- that uh, Chris over here has some thoughts on that. Uh, we'll touch, uh, touch on the Red Sox new hire. Uh, but talk about excitement. This guy. At least he played the game. I'll give him that a little bit. But, boy, did he sound just like his predecessor. Uh, We will get to that coming up next after the headlines here on Gaspar and Murray. 